After Frankenstein and Dracula got their first sequels in the mid-30s, Universal Studios tried to put its horror legacy in the grave, in order to get away from its increasingly salacious reputation, highlighted perhaps most explicitly in Dracula's Daughter, a movie so brazen that cinema historians still question its ability to get past the production code administration. Why are you looking at me that way? Won't I do? Yes, you'll do very well indeed. However, after only a little over two years without any horror films on the books, Universal couldn't shake the hunger audiences had for the classic monsters. Dracula and Frankenstein received a double-billed release in 1938 that did incredible business, so Universal made the decision to exhume and reanimate its franchises, starting with a second sequel to Frankenstein. When that movie, Son of Frankenstein, turned into a massive hit, Universal continued with the first sequel to one of its other horror franchises, The Invisible Man. Only this time, instead of making Claude Rains transparent, they turned to a young actor named Vincent Price. Jeffrey Radcliffe has been convicted of a murder he didn't commit, and his pleas for reprieve have fallen on unsympathetic ears. Just before he is scheduled to be executed, however, he vanishes into thin air to the befuddlement of his captors. With Griffin's unstable invisibility formula coursing through his veins, Radcliffe must track down the real killer before he succumbs to megalomania and madness and before he is captured by the dogged Scotland Yard investigator who knows all too well what he's up against. Before we really get started, if you could hit that like button, this channel might avoid the gallows for a few more weeks. If you really do like this video, please subscribe as well. Thank you in advance. With that out of the way, let's get back to the subject at hand. While the successful Son of Frankenstein was still in theaters in early 1939, Universal announced that it was developing The Invisible Man Returns, with Austrian-born Joe May, who had directed Confession and the House of Fear, in the director's chair, and hinting at the possibility of either Boris Karloff or Bela Lugosi in the title role. A few days after this initial announcement, Universal turned around and proclaimed that Rowland V. Lee, the producer-director of Son of Frankenstein as well as 1939's Tower of London, would direct. Sometime later, for unspecified reasons, Lee was removed and Joe May would once again be hired as director. Though Joe May had only been making films in America for about seven years at this point, he had dozens of previous films in Germany to his credit and is considered one of the pioneers of early German cinema, alongside such greats as Fritz Lang and Robert Vinay. The Invisible Man Returns would prove to be one of his final films, but he would go on to write the story for its follow-up, The Invisible Woman, which is something of a situational comedy that doesn't adhere to the continuity of the previous Invisible Man films. The writing duties for The Invisible Man Returns would change hands a few times as well, with the British playwright W.P. Lipscomb originally tapped to create the screenplay, followed by Michael Hogan, and finally, Lester K. Cole and Kurt Siodmak, the German-born brother of noir director Robert Siodmak. The story was formulated by Joe May, Kurt Siodmak, and a gentleman by the name of Cedric Belfridge, a communist fellow traveler who would go on to be a spy in World War II before founding the radical left-wing paper The National Guardian, and later being deported following interrogation by the House Un-American Activities Committee. When it came to casting the title character, after abandoning plans to hire Karloff or Lugosi, Universal wanted a virtual unknown, but one that was at least passably handsome and with a striking voice. I don't understand it. a man of that type. It didn't take the studio long to settle on Vincent Price, who had only a couple of films to his name and who had just completed work on Rowland Lee's Tower of London and James Whale's Green Hell. Though Tower of London, a historical picture, and Green Hell, a jungle adventure, could be seen as horror films if you squint the right way, The Invisible Man Returns is usually credited as Price's first foray into the genre that would later define his career. He was quick to make friends on set, 
and would prove to be a valuable asset for the director, seeing as how Joe May barely spoke a word of English and Price, knowing German, could translate for him. Though this is far from Price's most memorable performance, you can get a sense of the style he would become known for, especially in this scene where he torments the mining foreman Willie Spears. It's cold in the other world, so cold. Like Reigns before him, he is defined almost entirely by his voice, and when we do finally catch a glimpse of the young actor in the final moments of the film, I might be crazy, but he's the spitting image of a young Tom Hardy. Can somebody make a Vincent Price biopic with Hardy? I'd watch the heck out of that. Other actors from Tower of London were brought in as well, with Nan Gray, who had also starred in Dracula's Daughter as the female lead Radcliffe's fiancée Helen, and John Sutton as Frank Griffin, the younger brother of the original Invisible Man. The one big actor Universal brought in was the legendary Shakespearean veteran Sir Cedric Hardwick, who had previously appeared in 1936's Things to Come and 1937's King Solomon's Mines. Hardwick was going through some personal issues at the time and reportedly hated working on the film, his sole highlight being the strong bond he would form with Price. Despite this, he couldn't help but put in a fantastic performance as Richard Cobb, Radcliffe's cousin and the true villain of the story. He goes from stoic and sympathetic to deliciously evil with ease. The actor who really steals the movie for me, though, is the South African-born Cecil Kellaway, who would later star in Harvey, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, and Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, as Inspector Samson. Samson is the smartest, most cunning, and most interesting character, and Kellaway is clearly having a good time delivering some of the best lines of the film. It isn't him, sir. A profound observation. The final actor worth noting is Alan Napier as Willie Spears. Napier is a fascinating character in his own right, a cousin to the Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain and an accomplished classical actor who would find success with the likes of Orson Welles and Alfred Hitchcock. However, his most lasting legacy is his role as Alfred Pennyworth in the 1960s live-action Batman series. The Joker in Tim Burton's Batman, Jack Napier, is named after him. The Invisible Man Returns did face filming difficulties, ultimately going over schedule and over budget. Price spent most of the movie covered in black velvet, and the special effects team, headed by John P. Fulton, who had worked on the original Invisible Man, Dracula, Dracula's Daughter, and The Bride of Frankenstein, worked ludicrously long hours under tight time constraints, often pulling all-nighters and getting only a few hours of rest before returning to the set. Fulton would get an Academy Award nomination for his efforts, and he would go on to have major successes with films such as Vertigo and The Ten Commandments. Despite its production problems, when The Invisible Man Returns debuted in January of 1940, it grossed a worldwide total of $815,000 in theater rentals, roughly three times its final budget. Its success ensured more Universal Monster films in the years that followed, including a few more in the Invisible Man franchise. Don't worry, I'll be back. <laughs> Still, critics were lukewarm on the movie, arguing that it lacked the novelty or horror of the original, and that it had taken unwise influence from popular screwball comedies like Topper and Bringing Up Baby. In more recent years, it has gotten a critical re-evaluation, and is considered perhaps the best sequel in the entire franchise, even surpassing Invisible Agent, which would become the most profitable film in the series. For my money, I tend to agree. I've already gone on record stating that the original Invisible Man is my favorite classic Universal monster movie, and its first sequel makes for a great companion piece. No, Vincent Price's Radcliffe isn't as deliciously evil or entertaining as Claude Rains' Griffin, but The Invisible Man Returns has an interesting moral dilemma at the core of its plot that was only hinted at in James Whale's original. What do you know what goes on inside a man's mind? Outside he may look like a gentleman, but inside he may have the anchoring for murder. With Griffin, we only heard about his good-natured prior personality, and by the time the first movie opens, he has already begun the transition into an unrepentant megalomaniacal villain. However, Radcliffe is given far more sympathy and is in the very early stages of invisibility. He is shown as the victim of a judicial miscarriage, and the script is written in such a way that we want him to succeed, and we are genuinely terrified when he starts to show the first signs of devolving into an actual murderer. You hold the balance and decide which way life shall go. No one can stop you. 
no one can touch you. Granted, in the end of the film, he is unquestionably guilty of the voluntary manslaughter, if not outright murder, of Richard Cobb, not to mention the several hours of torture he inflicted upon Willie Spears, but the movie highlights the desperation and extenuating circumstances of his behavior. It tries to redeem him, to make him deserving of a happy ending. While that ending is a little bit too neat, I still think it raises more difficult questions than the original film ever did. And while it is true that The Invisible Man Returns lacks the novelty or manic energy of its predecessor, it is still an exceptional film on its own merits. The effects, while a little less flashy, are definitely superior, with a few sight gags that remain memorable to this day. On top of that, if you have to replace the great Claude Rains, I find it hard to imagine a better man for the job than Vincent Price. And that's all for today, my fellow Earthlings. What do you think? Is Jeffrey Radcliffe a redeemable character or a monstrous murderer? Let me know in the comments, and while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you want to support my channel even more, check out my Patreon to get access to bonus content, get your name in the credits, and more. My patrons vote on one movie I cover every single month. You can also visit my website at emigil.com, where you'll find written reviews of plenty more sci-fi classics in both film and literature. Until next time, though, when we'll go on an extraordinary expedition, this is the Unapologetic Geek, telling you to never be ashamed of what you love, as long as you're not hurting anybody. Under no circumstances allow him to take off his clothes. Take off his clothes? He won't do that, sir. There's a lady with him. <laughs>